Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name's Juliet Dryden, and I'm the director of BISA. Um, on behalf of uh, BISA and, of course, our vice chair, Professor Ruth Blakely, who's going to moderate today, um, we're, we're absolutely delighted to be hosting, jointly hosting this webinar with Chatham House um, on COVID journals and the gender gap. Um, a particular thank you to um, Andrew Dorman from International Affairs and his team for working together on this with us to make it possible. Um, it's really wonderful uh, to see so many of you. I can see there's, there's, there's more and more people joining um, to, to listen and participate in this event. Um, for those of you um, who don't know much about BISA, I wanted to just take this opportunity uh, just a minute or so to introduce, to introduce our association. We are the British International Studies Association, BISA. We're a charity um, and a membership organization. Um, and we aim to promote and develop international studies um, in the UK and also beyond. And we're really committed to furthering research, knowledge exchange, professional development, as well as teaching and learning. Um, we're a really active um, association. We've got lots going on. Um, we have uh, 29 research uh, working groups specializing on all sorts of different aspects to do with international relations. Um, to name just a few, we've got one on gendering IR, global health, war studies, um, foreign policy, ethics and world politics, peacekeeping and peace building, and a whole host um, of others. We also um, have a very active postgraduate network who organize their own events um, and a conference each year. We, um, we have our own publications, uh, two journals, um, both, both of the editors are, are obviously here today with us. The Review of International Studies, and, and I know Martin's here, and the European Journal of International Studies, um, and Jason is representing them. Also, we have a book series also published by Cambridge University Press. Um, we provide many funding opportunities for members. In fact, last year we gave almost 150,000 pounds of grants away. Um, we, we put on a large annual conference, which is open to everybody. Um, in fact, last week marked the week in which we would have held our conference in Newcastle. Um, sadly, we had to cancel it, but we really hope that next year in 2021, we can return. Um, and if not, we are aiming to put a fabulous week of back to back and simultaneous virtual events on. Um, we also provide networking opportunities between academics and policymakers. And we're also really delighted to now be putting on uh, two or three virtual events a week. Um, in fact, we've got a whole series of events with jointly with the Political Studies Association shortly around teaching and learning. Um, and in addition to all of these things, we have just announced our 2020 BISA prize winners. Um, so if you are interested to find out who won um, or any other aspect of BISA, um, you can find out lots more and how to join and so on on our website. Um, and I will just put that, that link in, in the chat. Um, so that's enough for me. You haven't come to, to hear uh, from me. So um, before, um, uh, I, think, I think I'll end there, but I'd now like to hand over to, to Andrew, please. Th thanks very much. Thank you very much, Juliet. And thank you all for coming. I'm not going to spend very much, speak for very long, just to speak on behalf of Chatham House and um, International Affairs to say thank you all for participating and being part of this. Um, it's the House's 100th anniversary and it's very much trying to look at the whole question of diversity and inclusion and and the whole issue of gender is one of those address issues that it's very much trying to address um, and we're just delighted to be part of the, uh, the scheme with BISA to try and work out how we can see more greater participation uh, from a gender perspective. And I'm going to hand straight over to Ruth and say, thank you, Ruth. Uh, Ruth is the, uh, set this up by putting out a challenge to journal editors at an ISA panel. So we, we want to thank her for, for putting that out and um, over to you. Thank you so much, Andrew. So it's a really, ple a really great pre pleasure to welcome all of you and particularly to thank our participants for giving up their time this afternoon to discuss this. I'm going to ask them each to introduce themselves and I'll go in the order of how you appear on my Zoom screen, which is going to be completely arbitrary. Um, so we'll start with Laura Considine. She's actually standing in for Jason Ralph, um, but I'll let her introduce herself. So Laura, um, turn your mic on. Thanks. 
Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, so I'm standing in for, for Jason Roth, who couldn't um, be here today. Um, my name is Laura Considine. I am um, at the University of Leeds and I'm an associate editor for the European Journal of International Security. Great, thank you. Um, Kyle Grayson, please. Hi, I'm Kyle Grayson. I'm the head of politics at Newcastle University. I am an editor of Critical Studies on Security, and I'm also the secretary of the British International Studies Association. Thanks, Kyle. Tracy German, please. Hi there. I'm um, from the Defence Studies Department at King's College London, and I've been the research lead for the last four years. I'm just stepping down. Thanks, Tracy. Hannah Lambie Mumford, please. Sorry. Um, hi everyone, I'm Hannah Landy Mumford. Um, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Sheffield. Thank you, Hannah. Tony Hastrup, please. Hi, I'm Tony Hastrup. I'm still a lecturer at the University of Stirling and one of the editors in chiefs of General of Common Market Studies. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Kim Hutchins, please. Sorry, getting a bit slow there. Uh, I'm Kim Hutchings. I'm currently head of, of the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary. Um, and I've previously been a journal editor for the Review of International Studies and the European Journal of International Relations and one or two others. Um, and also been heads of departments, a couple of the other universities as well. Thanks, Kim. Amanda Chisholm, please. Hi, thanks. So um, I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Security Studies at um, KCL, and I'm also a lead for diversity and inclusion for the school as well. Thank you, Amanda. Martin Coward, please. Hi, I'm Martin Coward. I'm a reader at uh, University of Manchester, and I am the lead editor for Review of International Studies. Thanks, Martin. Richard Beardsworth, please. Richard, you're still muted. Okay, um, Julia Welland, please. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julia Welland. I'm an assistant professor of war studies uh, at the University of Warwick, and I'm also a trustee at, uh, of BISA. Thank you, Julia. Roberta Garina, please. Hi, I'm uh, the director of the Center for Research on uh, Gender at the University of Bristol and also one of the editors of the Journal of Common Market Studies Annual Review and on the editorial board of the Journal of European Integration. Uh, previously, I was director for equality, diversity and inclusion at my previous uh, institution, so quite a lot of experience on Athena Swan related issues. Thanks, Roberta. Richard, have we got your mic working? No. Okay, I'll introduce you and hopefully we can get it sorted before the discussion. So Richard Beardsworth is Professor of International Relations and Head of Department in Politics and International Relations at the University of Leeds and has lots of experience uh, in editing journals as well. Um, and he's also one of the trustees of Visa. I've um, pre-prepared some questions for our panellists, which they had in advance. Um, and we've broadly divided them into three groups. So heads of department, editors, and then early and mid-career colleagues. But for all of them, as you've heard, there's a fair degree of overlap. overlap. So we've got people here in their capacity as a, an early and mid-career colleague who also have editing experience and diversity experience. So the questions that I've shared with them, um, they may wish to speak to some of the other issues as well. I've left that to their discretion. So I'd like to start with um, the following people. So Amanda, Tony, Jasmine, Julia, and Hannah. Um, and I guess if you could address some of the questions we asked about how you've been experiencing challenges around your own research in relation to the pandemic, whether you're aware of initiatives in your own departments and universities to try and monitor the impact of the pandemic on research, um, for yourselves, but also for others around you, um, particularly thinking about diversity issues, maybe. And then finally, whether you think there are particular actions you think universities and journals and professional associations ought to be taken. 
taking. So I'll let you choose what you speak to and if there's other things you want to bring in, please do. Um, and at the risk of putting you on spot, Julia, do you mind if we start with you? Thanks. Hi, thank you, Ruth. So um, I'll just uh, speak to two at the beginning. So um, it gives others the opportunity to jump on board. So in relation to the first question about particular challenges around uh, research, um, when I was thinking about this, both my own experience and those of colleagues, I think for a lot of people, what the pandemic and then associated lockdown has brought into kind of sharp relief is existing challenges that were already there and they've now since just been exacerbated. So whether it's uh, to do with uh, caring responsibilities towards children or others, and you're having children at home now or been responsible for homeschooling, um, but also things like heightened anxiety, support networks of friends or grandparents or others no longer been an option. Um, and then also just things like straightforward tasks of doing the food shopping becoming far uh, uh, longer tasks to do, uh, but potentially bringing up feelings of anxiety um, and all those kind of things. So I think this all then impacts on not only time, but also the headspace that is required for the kind of research we do, um, so or, or research full stop. And so I think for a lot of us, all of these things already existed and the pandemic has merely kind of brought them into a sharp relief. Um, and I think, of course, there is always a, a gendered um, element to these, uh, to these things about who's doing the care labour, who's doing the emotional labour that these things require. Um, and then my, my second comment would just be about the way in which care is recognised within the academy. Um, so for me personally, my department has been really supportive of me as a parent of a toddler and I've been given lots of support, but I think there's lots of ways in which uh, care work goes unrecognized uh, within the academy, particularly around uh, the ways in which people uh, put in place caring networks, particularly women of, of, of color, because they don't necessarily feel nurtured or cared for in the uh, environment of academia. And this is the kind of care work I think that doesn't perhaps get recognized, get discussed at an equality and diversity committee, for example, at departmental or institutional level. So I think that might be worth thinking about the ways in which certain care is recognized and isn't. So I'm gonna stop there because I'm just thinking there's lots of people who have lots more to say. Okay, thanks so much, Julia. Perhaps could we move to Tony next, please? Yes, uh, thank you. I mean, I would just echo everything that Julia has already said, but perhaps to add a bit more context. So obviously, we sort of started 2000 and 2020 crisis with COVID. But we're now in a space right now where that's not the only crisis. And I think that very much feeds into uh, what's going on feeds very much into uh, questions around diversity and inclusion, and especially of the space um, that the academy leaves for uh, minor minoritized people. So when I'm thinking, both in terms of my own research and how I'm able to access the resources uh, broadly defined to do that, those are some of the things I'm thinking about. The headspace isn't just about what COVID has done, but actually I think some of what has been inhibiting to research is not just COVID itself, but the responses to COVID and uh, the responses to our current global moment. So when I'm thinking about that, I don't have uh, particular care duties uh, in terms of in my home, but I also know that I'm the one who has to reach out to my students of color who are very traumatized by the fact that some of them can't go home because of COVID, because uh, the, their country's borders have been closed, but they're also black students who are having to deal with the trauma of um, uh, the very brutal um, racist, international racist regime within which we have to live in. Um, and nobody thinks specifically about those students in those terms because uh, as far as the, at least speaking about the UK, as far as the UK Academy is concerned, particularly around international students, it's just about, you know, what are their fees, what, what fees are they paying to be frank? So, one is left to undertake those types of caring duties 
that are unrecognized because they were never accounted for in the first instance. And I think I would agree with Julia that, you know, I mean, we can look at this broader, that's what tends to happen if the, oftentimes it's the women that sort of take on this works, even when it's outside of the description of the pastoral care that um, they have to uh, perform. So there's that element and that doesn't stop. So, um, you know, this time last year, we all probably had six weeks in the summer, but that's all disappeared now for a variety of reasons, which kind of leads me to sort of, uh, my second point around responses to research. So when Ruth, you asked that question about, you know, how has he affected my own research and how is my, you know, how is the institution sort of responding to that? I just had nope, nope written next to that because everybody's resources has been diverted to teaching. Now, most of us within the academy are very, very committed to teaching, are often quite excited about teaching. And I must say, it's the one thing I miss most about having to work from home but by the same token, most of us, our teaching is very much informed by the research. So when you have a situation where we've been forced to sort of bifurcate these two um, dimensions of our everyday work, it's very difficult to adjust to uh, mentally, number one. It's also very difficult to adjust to practically. How can I teach effectively? And I'm not talking about these webinars about how to teach online. But how can I teach the subject effectively so that my my students are actually learning, which is my only, you know, my only purpose, when um, that is no longer informed because uh, the research has been deprioritized. Now, given that we're only a few months into it, I don't have an answer for that yet. But I certainly think it's something that uh, departments should be thinking about and, and thinking about very clearly, not sort of saying, Oh yeah, we decrease your one points uh, temporarily, and then we'll up that again. No, it's about the practicalities of you know how do we actually do this job that is our primary job to get students to learn when we cannot you know basically we have one hand tied behind our back, and right now it's all being put on the fact that well you know lockdown restrictions or you can't travel or finances but we're still expected to do everything the same way. And I think this is where perhaps professional associations uh, can help. I'll stop now, thanks. Thank you so much, Tony. I see lots of nodding and looks of recognition, but before I move to the heads of department who of course have all the magic answers, <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask Hannah to come in. Hannah, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me today. It's really nice to, to speak to this, this group. Um, I'm actually new to the politics department as is coming to the end of my first year, so it's been a slightly odd um, time. I've come from SPERI, which is an interdisciplinary research space, um, and I've got uh, degrees in geography and, and politics and sort of policy studies. So um, it's really nice to, to talk to you guys today. Um, I had sort of three key reflections so the first very much builds on, on what was said uh, before around this idea of sort of headspace. So myself, I'm a very applied researcher. Uh, my work is, is looking at food insecurity. So it's obviously a topic uh, directly impacted. Well, I mean, everything's been directly impacted by, on, by COVID. But um, in terms of research, and there's some urgent questions that I'm keen to get into. And actually, um, very much just reacting to the situation rather than being able to find that time to think what do we need to build on sort of the theoretical basis, which obviously feeds into the key theme of the, of the session, which is writing for journals, you know, the, the time and the space that you need for that. So certainly to echo that, which I'm sure everyone, everyone has felt the same as well. Um, I think the other thing, which again echoes a lot of what has been said so far, but it's I think the importance of looking at what we've experienced in the last few months and how that's going to play out and embed further in the coming months and probably years with fairly long um, shadow. So I think it's very much to sort of take stock and also think about what that means. Um, I think some of those um, inequalities are very much going to be become more and more hidden um, from view as things move on and as, as time and everyone's responses kind of grow. Um, so I think that's something we just need to be aware of, which is, which is what you've suggested today in terms of thinking about what's next. But I do think as we try and do that, I'm afraid, Ruth, I don't have a list of top three suggestions for what to do. Sorry, I'm going to let the other speakers contribute those. But um, 
I think a big part of that is going to be about having open discussions like this, like today, and actually to really work together as a community with everybody, because, you know, everybody's life has been touched in some way. And actually to have those discussions openly with everybody, I think is going to be really important to tackle this as an academic community across disciplines, within disciplines, within departments. I think that's going to be really crucial. Um, and I think one way, uh, a good starter from my experience in, in my department, our um, Equality and Diversity Committee did a survey to staff to ask them what their experiences were. Um, and they've taken that and analysed the findings. And we use that as a basis of a discussion at a departmental meeting. And things like that were really helpful. And I think personally for me, coming from um, the EDI committee was also really nice. So it wasn't coming from a sort of centralised HR type process, it was coming from a supportive space of a kind of colleague, um, colleague based discussion, which I thought was good. So I would definitely um, put that up as a sort of as something that I found was really supportive. It gave me the chance to really freely talk about um, what I'd experienced and that was put together with other responses. Um, and I think it just started a discussion in our department, which hopefully will be built on. Um, okay, they were my three things. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I should probably declare an interest, which is that I am the incoming head of politics at Sheffield. So all of these headaches are now mine. Um, and I haven't paid Hannah to say anything positive about the department, I can assure you, because there's no money left. Um, so um, just to flag up, we've actually temporarily lost Amanda, I think, which is possibly an internet con connection issue. And also Jasmine Garney was due to join us, but she's been hit by the Virgin Media outage in London. Um, so we're hoping that they may join us and I'll find a way of bringing them in if, if they can. Um, so I, I suppose I'd quite like to move to some of the heads now to kind of get some reflections on what they've heard so far, things they might be thinking about in their own departments and universities. So they were given three questions for homework. The first was, is your university or department tracking the impacts of COVID on women, ECRs and those with additional care and responsibilities? Are steps being taken to mitigate disproportionate effects on particular groups in terms of probation, promotion, workload and caring duties? And have any of you had experience of Athena Swan? And what are your views on its efficacy in addressing some of these issues? Because I think that's quite a, that's sometimes an elephant in the room. So maybe could we go to Kim first, please? I can actually see Jasmine now, so I wonder if there's a chance to get her input before we move on to me. Great suggestion. Thanks, Kim. So, um, Jasmine, welcome. Um, it's nice to have you. We've just had a round of thoughts, initial thoughts from earlier mid-career colleagues, and we were just about to move on to um, heads. But before we do that, I'd be nice to hear from you in response to the questions I sent. So if it's not too much to kind of put you on the spot like that. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth and Andrew, for inviting me to be a part of this roundtable. Sorry for dropping out. I think there's outage problems here. Um, I'm not sure what everyone else said, um, so I might repeat some of the things that others had mentioned. Um, for me, I, I wanted to, um, when we think about caring responsibilities, um, especially in relation to the gender gap, often we think about childcare, understandably. I just wanted to make sure that we extend that to thinking about um, caring responsibilities for the elderly or other um, family members who have health issues, but also thinking about caring responsibilities in the community, right? Um, so those who are involved in grassroots activism, those who are actually just generally engaged in community service. And the research does show that this is a gendered issue because mainly it's women who are involved in community service. The majority of people who get involved in that and would be women. So that would have had um, significant impact on in, any academics involved in that during the peak of the pandemic because obviously the demands and the needs of the community increased. So those responsibilities would have increased as well. And I think that's definitely something that isn't really on the radar. And there's a sense that that's something which is voluntary, it's something that you choose to do. But if you're committed to it, then that's obviously going to have an impact on your time. The other thing I wanted to mention um, is to, if possible, broaden this discussion a bit. I think um, obviously talking about the gender gap is hugely important. Um, but this is also an opportunity to think about other disparities in the academy. Um, so if we recognise that there's a broad lesson um, from some of the data that's emerged from uh, journal submissions, that um, we as academics and our research are not incubated from global and local events, 
um, our research is affected and different people are affected in different ways, but also some categories of people are affected disproportionately negative ways. And if we take that lesson, then we have to extend the gender gap to recognizing there's also like to be a class gap and there's almost certainly like to be an ethnic minority or race gap. Um, and what um, has been particularly striking, obviously, in the past few weeks, we've seen the Black Lives Matter protest against racial injustices in the US and elsewhere is that any issues that women academics would have been facing anyway because of the pandemic would have been, certainly would have been compounded by other events happening around the world. Um, if particularly if you are um, a black female academic or if you're a woman of color, um, and it wouldn't just be in terms of the lack of focus and emotional energy that that would have taken up, but also there's institutional responsibilities. Students of color would have been turning to those academics of color um, more to discuss these issues because they feel that they'd have more empathy on it. So that's, that's an honor to be able to offer that support, but all of that would have had implications for our ability to do research. So I think, I guess, um, and then often those categories, minoritized categories, would be less likely to come forward to voice their concerns, right? So with the COVID issue and um, with the data sample we have with gender, actually we it's, it's large enough to be able to um, draw conclusions but when it's um, minoritized groups where we're not as attuned to some of the issues they might be facing they're like less likely to come forward to voice their concerns because it might feed into stereotypes about their academic competence or suitability for research and um, then we're less likely to pick up some of those gaps um, that exist beyond just gender so i think it's really important to talk about gender but obviously those um, issues then get compounded if you bring other factors into the equation Fantastic. Thank you, Jasmine. And I'm so glad you made it in the end. Um, so, Kim, over to you, please. Thanks very much. And, and thanks for organising this, um, Ruth, and for the comments that we've heard so far. I mean, I think in many ways, as a head of school, it's, it's the same kind of issues that are coming up all the time in terms of the impact of what's been going on on everybody, but the differential impact on um, different people depending on their kind of structural position if you like. Um, just wanting to pick up on what both Tony and, and Jasmine have said, um, we've certainly um, been very conscious in our student body and we're in the East End of London which was a massive hot spot and quite a lot of our students are local um and uh black or or or, or of color and and that has meant that uh we can expect a much higher level of bereavement for example from our students than might be the case or having gone through traumatic illness of of, of relatives and so on so it, it's it's always been very clear to us that this has to be thought about i hate the word but intersectionally you know it can't it can't be just separated out into different um groups we have to look at the way that various sort of lines um, cross cut each other when it comes to how people are impacted uh, both psychologically and obviously in terms of, of, of you know being able to do work needing extenuating circumstances all those kinds of things trying to respond to Ruth's the questions Ruth said uh, the question was phrased was is your university stroke department and the more I thought about it the more this was really important because certainly where I work there is stuff going on at the central level in the university and then there is stuff that both the faculty and the schools within the faculty are trying to do and they don't always fit very nicely with each other um I and mean, we're very lucky in politics and ir to have um the faculty edi lead as one of our members rainbow murray and she's actually been undertaking this huge job of basically an equalities impact assessment across all the different sort of um, uh, kinds of inequality of the COVID crisis. And, you know, it's this, it's this massive document and it's kind of, and then she's trying to sort of systematize what has been done to address various of the problems, what needs to be done. And she's trying to get this through central management. So it's gone through the central EDI structures not entirely smoothly but it's kind of gone through it's now gone to senior executive teams but it's now a question of whether will and resource will be put into really making that happen so we've been conscious of a bit of a strain sometimes between what's going on at the university level and what's going on at the uh, school level or the faculty level we're absolutely um taking steps in relation to um 
uh, things like probation, promotion, workload questions, both to map and to address where people may have been affected. So, for example, uh, I mean, people have basically been told, look, don't, you know, if, if your probation targets from last year aren't met, of course they're not going to be met in these circumstances. We need to rethink, we need to restate things much more provisionally, et cetera, et cetera. Which is fine, I think, for the moment, but it comes back to what a couple of people have said. This could cast a very long shadow. So then I think we have to become much more systematic about this in relation to those processes. I think for this year, there's lots of sort of, well, we're in this emergency situation. Of course, we'll do this, this and this. But the question is, what then happens in the years after uh, when somebody has maybe not been able to do their work for a year or 18 months or whatever it might be? So that, I think, is a real problem. And I don't think we've got any answers to that yet. I think we're still operating a bit on kind of this is a bit of an emergency mode. And we need to get more into this is a new way of doing things. These are the things we're putting in place to protect people. This is how we need to change our criteria or our rules or our expectations or whatever it might be. So I think there is an issue about the longer term that we haven't perhaps, well, can't have addressed yet, but we'll need uh, to address. The other thing I just want to say, we're not Athena Swan. We've just been through the process of getting bronze uh, recognition. We tried the year before and got knocked back, in part because they felt we weren't paying enough attention to gender, gender material. Because, because of our student cohort and because of our particular context, actually we wanted to put the focus on BAME. Um, issues as well as gender and we kind of got told off for that a bit so our experience in that respect was somewhat negative from Athena Swan but when we put it back in we did again make a you know make it very clear that it's that that we want to look at the cross-cutting of different um, inequalities and our action plan was very clear that issues around um, you know uh, improving representation of BME staff improving pipeline of BME students through to masters and PhD were definitely part of what we were going to be wanting to be measured on over time. So I think maybe they're becoming a bit more flexible on what they will accept. I know they've also been changing a bit the process, so it may be less heavy than it was for us, but I have to say I did find it something of a bureaucratic nightmare. Useful for making you think quite systematically about things but a huge amount of work in a context in which, you know, there's already more than enough work to do a lot of the time. So those are my reflections for the moment. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, Tracy, I haven't brought you in yet. Would you like to come in now, please? Yeah, I've had a bit of a promotion to the heads of department section. Um, I was a, a research leader, I still am. So I've been sitting on our senior management team and um, in fact, just to follow up on that point about Athena Swan, our department went through it a few years ago with war studies as the school of security studies. We got knocked back, um, but it was very interesting. There was a huge amount of work to do and the work generally fell on, on the female members of both, department, both departments. Um, and it's, uh, I assume we will be putting in again um, at some point, but um, I think it's probably fallen down the list of priorities at the moment, which is a real shame because um, there's a lot of work I think that needs to be done um, in, in our departments about it. Just um, in terms of what we've been doing, um, I know the School of Security Studies has been doing some tracking work um, in terms of trying to account for care um, care providers, those who are kind of caregivers, and how that has impacted both on their research and their work in general, and what we can do to support them. But I think this is work that's only really just got off the ground in the last couple of weeks, month, um, and someone talked about reacting and that's very much, I feel like we're very much on the back foot here, just reacting, just trying to get ahead of it. Um, and Amanda, who unfortunately has dropped off of this, she's taking the lead um, on this work. Her, her internet connection comes in and out. Um, many meetings where she's there and then she's not. But um, she's really been taking the lead and she was very keen to try and get this up to the faculty, um, and in fact, uh, college level before the start of the new year. Um, 
we'll see whether we can actually achieve that um, because I think it really needs to be taken into account. From the research side, I have to say, I'm not sure that you know, there's been much focus actually on the impact um, that this has had. And in fact, we have seen almost a negative move because sabbaticals for next year um, across the college are currently on hold being reviewed. And it remains to be seen whether they will be um, put up for everybody again. And the criteria that was put out for those who would be eligible next year didn't include those who might have been impacted by um, caregiving over this crisis. And I think that was disappointing because I think it has had a huge impact. And it's interesting, I can see the, the disparities between those colleagues who are really happy to be kind of stuck at home. They've got plenty of time to focus on their research. And then those who've, you know, homeschooling, other caregiving that has really kind of taken away the headspace for research. And I think this is, you know, moving forwards, it's going to be a real challenge for promotion, probation. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm stepping down. I, I hope my, my successor kind of focuses on this um, as a long-term issue. Um, Kim, you mentioned that the long shadow and the, the, the long-term implications of all of this. And I hope very much that our, you know, our management team really kind of focus on this moving forwards and not just the constant, constant reaction, really. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Tracy. Quite sobering reflections there for all of us, I think. Um, Richard, can we see if your microphone works? Does that work? Yes, Richard. Good. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I changed support, so great. Okay, do you, um, did you just want to hear me or do you want me to go ahead and say something? Right, okay. Um, yeah, uh, like every, um, thanks to Juliet overall with BISA. Um, and for everything that she's doing as director. Um, and thank you to Andrew and to Ruth uh, for specifically for this and for the opportunity to speak. I mean, I'm rightly coming in in the head of school, head of department section. Um, and I think, I think a lot has already been said. So by the very fact that we are repeating ourselves, I think the, the problems are clear. I think the first point is that we are being reactive. It is very difficult to be proactive. Um, I think we're learning as we go along. I'm certainly learning. Um, I've just come into this role at Leeds University. Uh, I was previously uh, head of department at Aberystwyth and I know Aberystwyth is going through very particular things. So we're all in very different um, situations. And going back to what I think both Kim and Tracy said, and it also goes back to something that Tony said, uh, around how we differentiate the question of care. I'm very well aware within the school at Leeds that care is being done by both sets of parents um, and at the same time there are single parents. Um, I'm one of them but I'm also aware that uh, predominantly the single parents are women uh, in the school and therefore the question of care is both going up towards um, parents and down towards children and to get to capture that or as Kim said to map it it's it's very difficult and it's going to take time and it's going to take time take time excuse me to work out how to create policy out of that in terms of being proactive um, what we have done so far is that um, within a, a very tightly solidaristic faculty of social science with the schools within it uh, we're working very carefully with the faculty um, and we are now beginning to survey carefully uh, impact, but it will be an ongoing uh, practice um, through the coming months. And I think we're all going to be learning what exactly a hybrid model is in the first semester. And again, the question of care and the relationship between care and research time is going to be very important and it's going to be very specific to individuals in structural conditions, as Kim said. Um, so I can do nothing but re-endorse what has already been said and believe very strongly that the best practice is individual meetings as well as group meetings to tease out 
uh, because not everyone wants to speak about their particular circumstances, to tease out in confidence uh, what the impact is for each individual and for each family. I think one of the things we've done at Leeds, and I'm actually quite pleased about this, I'm not sure if I'm proud, but I'm pleased. Um, we'll see how it goes, because it'll depend on student numbers, and we're all going to be rushing <laughs> as heads to those numbers in August and September. And it'll be either a moment of panic or a moment of quiet relief. Uh, I fear it's going to be the former, uh, but we'll see. Um, and that is, uh, we've been able, uh, and we're a team here, and we're working carefully as a team, uh, to be able to provide 30% um, research allocation for next year within um, teaching and research profiles. Uh, I'm very pleased with that because it means that in the individual meetings I'm conducting at the moment around workload allocations and general professional development through next year, it means that we can focus on research and say your research is important and it's important that we recognise how it's going to be done all the while knowing um, that care will intersect with that in ways that we have yet to calculate. So th those are the general things uh, I wanted to say. Um, and I do really want to, to stress the circumstantial and the importance of individual conversations, which I think, you know, with this technology, uh, Zoom, Teams, we can do and we can do efficiently. Um, but um, I, I know it's stressful for us all um, to be online so much. I think with regard to your third question, about Athena Swan, um, uh, we have also just gone through this and we, we, we got bronze. Um, I'm sort of new to the process, uh, partly because I've been out of the country for quite a while um, and didn't really catch up on it when I came back in uh, five years ago. Um, <clears throat> So I, I don't know the whole culture of it from STEM at the beginning of the century. Um, but my feeling is, um, I mean, you, you spoke about it, Ruth, as an elephant in the room. Um, and I did hear Kim carefully about, you know, it, it, it is clunky. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, Tracy said that as well. Um, it's been good in terms of making things aware. Uh, uh, in terms of thinking systematically about equality and inclusion at both the school and the faculty level. Again, here the faculty and the school are working very carefully together with regard to this, so we're mirroring. Um, I think it has been an important process and uh, we equally have a uh, lead at faculty who's also a member of the school, so the mirroring has been uh, very well uh, accomplished. And I think um, just in terms of benchmark and practices, it's been very useful. And certainly for me, in terms of things like part time promotion, promotion for part timers, um, return to work from care, and perhaps giving more research time at that moment. Um, and generally, and here it's intersectional, um, as Kim said, uh, thinking about of unconscious bias. It has been important. It, it certainly made me think, um, and I think it's made other um, leaders in the school think as well. Um, so I, I, I do think it's an enormous amount of work, and I think it has fallen disproportionately on women. Um, I think the positive side is it's brought out some really important issues that could have been simply put back on the back burner. Um, and are no longer marginalised. Thanks very much, Ruth. Thank you very much, Richard. So can I move now to Kyle, please? Thank you, Ruth. And I'll try and be quick because I think everybody has said what I might want to say and said it much better uh, than I can possibly do. But I think what I would like to do is just kind of highlight the broader challenges that all of this speaks to from sitting in the position of a, a head of a subject area. And I think my first observation would be that one of the challenges we face are that universities are a reflection of the societies in which they're embedded. And I know that's not a shock to anybody sitting on the panel, but what it can mean is that Oftentimes, there's a difficulty in even getting particular issues recognized by colleagues as issues because there's a sense that we're better than this. Um, clearly, these can't be taking places in, in the workspaces that we're involved in, and they do. And so, you know, any 
that can often be the first sort of challenge and difficulty that we face. I think a second um, challenge is that when it comes to a lot of equality, diversity, and inclusion issues, and particularly around caring issues, it is a hostile legal environment. In the UK, no employer needs to make any reasonable adjustment on the basis of caring responsibilities. That's the law, unfortunately. And so it then means that uh, it places uh, both heads of subject uh, as well as colleagues into very difficult positions where you want to help somebody and help them in a way that's formally recognized and, and identified within institutional structures but get the pushback on these kinds of things. And so what you often find is that you end up working to develop ad hoc or short-term solutions to structural problems that really essentially require structural change. And this, of course, can then, as, as Kim mentioned earlier, be exacerbated by the structure of universities themselves and the fact that they're multi-levels, they're siloed, uh, and that oftentimes as a head of subject or head of school, that you may be completely cut off from particular decision-making structures. And so you oftentimes uh, you know, end up in situations where somebody is asking you for something that you would like to do, but it's not in your gift to be able to provide it for them. It raises issues then, I think, in terms of the battles that we pick, uh, particularly in light of kind of the emergency situation and oftentimes the very urgent things that, that come forward in terms of what colleagues are struggling for. And again, I, I think that notion of picking battles won't be uh, something that many of the panelists themselves are, are, are very familiar with. I think there's another thing that emergency situations do, which, uh, and, and the challenge is to ensure that equality, diversity, and inclusion issues don't get put on the back burner, that they're always seen as essential, that they're always seen as being embedded in whatever we do, and that they're not something optional that you think about when you have the time. And if I was going to, you know, uh, put forward one of the positives of the Athena Swan is that I think when you are in an environment where um, you have uh, Athena Swan recognition or seeking recognition, that helps in terms of embedding EDI into everything that you do. But there's a, a, a flip side to that, which is thinking of the EDI implications of EDI. And again, many of you will be well aware of the critique of Athena Swan that it, it works very well for particular kinds of people and maybe not so well for others. And so really thinking through when you are trying to address these issues, are you being fair to everyone and are you treating like cases in a like way? So I'll end it there. Thanks. Thank you, Kyle. It wouldn't be a collection of IR scholars if we didn't get on to structure and agency debates. So thank you. Um, but I think that's massively important to think about those structures that we have to operate within and how challenging they can be. I'm going to move now to our journal editors. But of course, you're not just editors. You have experience as academics in leadership roles as well. So feel free to speak to any of the other issues if you wish to. I asked editors to comment on any changes they'd seen in rates of submission to their journals from women and early career colleagues. I asked them if they'd had any feedback from the community on how the pandemic is impacting people in terms of engagement with journals, and that can be around reviewing and uh, submissions as well. And then I asked if they'd taken any measures to support those whose research has been impacted. So could I please come to Martin first? Sure. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the invite to participate and um, I, I won't kind of repeat a, a lot of things that have been said. Um, in terms of um, submissions to the journals, um, the one thing I'd like to say is that um, the system Scholar One that we use for submissions is not particularly good at gathering statistics. So it will gather statistics, for example, for um, the gender of the lead author, but it won't, for example, drill down. So if a team uh, is, I don't know, 75% male, but 25% female, for example, it won't capture that. Uh, it'll just capture who actually makes the submission. Um, and at present, we, we don't capture statistics on things like, for example, how many uh, black uh, or minority uh, ethnicity um, authors are submitting. We don't have any uh, real kind of uh, grasp of uh, differentiation sort of geographically either. 
Um, and so the statistics are always a little bit kind of to be taken uh, with a pinch of salt. That said, um, at the beginning, um, I was worried. Um, I saw in April, we saw a spike in the number of submissions. Um, and um, in hindsight, I do wonder whether that was to do with the cancellation of um, ISA, um, that people had papers that they were going to take to the ISA. They were kind of, you know, almost there, so they put them in for review in, in, instead. Um, since then, actually, for us at Review of International Studies, stats have been pretty normal. They've been pretty much like last year. Um, and um, the thing to say about that is that in terms of um, lead authors, uh, that means that about 30% of our submissions are from uh, where lead authors are women uh, and about 70% uh, men. Uh, and this has been kind of reasonably consistent uh, across months and across years. Now, the interesting thing about that is that that's not actually reflected in the number of articles that are, it, that are accepted. So although women are less likely to submit, they are more likely to be accepted and published around 50%. Um, and uh, I, there are reasons I could speculate on for that, um, but uh, nothing solid. The one thing where uh, we have noticed a vast reduction is in our call for um, uh, submissions to a special issue. Uh, last year we had about 19 uh, proposals, this year we had four. Uh, and I had conversations with prospective uh, teams who uh, effectively just said, look, we can't, we can't get it together. Now, one of the things we did with special issues um, was, which was a kind of fortunate accident, I won't pretend it was a deliberate response to the pandemic, it was a kind of fortunate accident, is that we've actually uh, decided to have two dates of submission every year. So we were able to kind of uh, encourage these teams, you know, and we've worked with them, we've given feedback and so on and so forth. But those who couldn't make it for a submission in June, um, we were able to kind of say, well, look, you know, come back in December, hopefully uh, the, the extra kind of six months will give you time to kind of get that proposal uh, together. And we've obviously given kind of individual feedback uh, on, I think I've given individual feedback on about kind of six of those applications. So, uh, but I think, you know, it reflects the fact that um, getting together a team at a time like this uh, is a substantial challenge. Um, the thing I actually worry about most as an editor is the long is the kind of the long tail if you like so you know when when uh when it gets to september and term starts again and the university has forgotten that we all still have kids at home and things like that uh or parents who are shielding and, and so on and so forth uh there will be an assumption that things are back to normal but actually i think that we're going to see a kind of long tail of uh, of kind of impact on submissions to journals. And I think that the, I think that the way I would put this is that um, what I notice from my sort of inbox is, um, what I notice is that the uh, submissions we have are often quite uh, data analysis driven at the moment. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm working on a hunch that the, that the kind of article that requires sort of time for thoughtful reflection on things like theoretical concepts and so on, uh, the people are struggling a little bit with getting the time and the headspace to do that. And, and I suspect there may be a long tail uh, in that regard. Um, with anecdotal evidence um, from community about people you know, with caring responsibilities finding it harder to submit, um, I have personally, you know, experienced that as, as a dad. Um, and, I, and, I, and I don't doubt those anecdotes. Um, I'm not quite sure uh, exactly what we can do. I think there are kind of three things that we hope to do. Um, one of the things we hope to do is to um, change our instructions for both reviewers and for authors, uh, but particularly for reviewers, particularly asking reviewers to think about whether there is promise in the paper because reviewers are, are often too quick to go, this isn't ready. But if somebody's been, you know, working hard to get something to a position where they let it go to us, but because of the circumstances, it may not be as good as it might have been uh, previously. What we want the reviewers to look at is promise, not is it ready now, right? And so what we will be asking reviewers to think about is, could this be ready in say two rounds of revisions? Um, and hopefully that will, uh, you know, encourage them to think about, um, uh, about the impact uh, on authors. I think then the second thing is we need to be, we can be more proactive about encouraging people to submit 
the anecdotal evidence is that um, you, certain groups of authors are, are, are hold on to papers for longer than other groups of authors. Uh, they want them to be kind of, you know, more sort of, uh, you know, sort of review ready. Um, and I think it's encouraging those constituencies to let go of papers uh, on the kind of understanding that, you know, we will try and make it clear to reviewers that actually, you know, the current circumstances should be taken into account when thinking about the promise of a paper. Um, and then I think one of the things we will try and do, but obviously this is really hard for um, uh, an editorial team that's spread across uh, what, four continents uh, and several time zones. Um, uh, we will try and set up some kind of um, workshops. And this is something that we've been thinking about doing for particular groups of, uh, of authors. I think we'll probably start with uh, women early career scholars uh, and scholars from the global south, hopefully. Uh, and the kind of uh, workshop where people uh, can apply to participate uh, and with with a paper that they ultimately want to bring to either our journal or, or another journal, but but to get uh, editorial input as to, to how to develop that, not from kind of early, but, uh, but in terms of kind of getting it into a, a review. And hopefully, because I think part of it is about confidence as well so hopefully that will also help people to kind of get into get their papers into to review because i think ultimately that's the the main problem that we that we face fantastic martin and some really good suggestions there for what you're going to be doing can i come to roberta now please Hi, thank you. And um, thanks uh, as well, Ruth, for organising this and listening to the heads of the department. I am so glad I'm no longer a head of the department, um, particularly at this point. Um, there are crises and there are crises and this is one of those. Uh, so a couple of things that uh, reflections now three months into this uh, this crisis as uh, as someone who's done quite a lot of work on equality and diversity at the institutional level within departments but also as uh, as journal editor um, so one of the the first thing that comes to mind and part of the conversations I've had with um, some of my networks is that what is interesting here and some of the conversations we're having today is that we're talking about structural inequalities in a way that we haven't done before, rather in the mainstream, in the media. So there is much greater recognition that issues to do with care, gender divisions of labor, uh, intersectional issues do affect the, our ability to perform within uh, the formal marketplace. So the questions about who cares are hugely important, both within the family and the department. But they're also hugely important because, in a way, it's about over the next nine months, who's setting the record for the kind of research that is going to come through to shape the, the discipline going forward. So the kind of thinking that we have, the thinking time that people may or may not have, will not just shape which groups or individuals are able to submit papers for review and for publication, but also the kind of topics and the issues that will be discussed. And here, actually, I would urge us to think uh, a little bit more widely and really consider the impact it also has on funding applications. At this particular point of crisis where we know university incomes are being stretched and heads of departments, I am sure, are all being encouraged to increase the inc research capture for uh, the next year at a time when the pool is shrinking. And there is an increasing focus on responsive mode, um, grants specifically related to COVID. So the question that I would really pose is who has the time, the space and the capacity to actually turn the research to focus on those pressing issues? Who is likely to be able to submit those grant applications, win the grant applications, and therefore produce the publications going forward in the future. So my main concern from an equality and diversity perspective is that at this particular juncture, as we're all becoming aware of equalities and structural inequalities in relations to gender, to race, and so on, we're probably also going to forget about all of those things because we're not embedding them in the kind of research that we're applying and is likely to be funded going forward in the medium to long term. So uh, data is important, um, not 
just from a journal perspective, but also from an institutional perspective. I am really um, heartened to hear that there are a few institutions who are taking on equality and diversity impact assessments, but those are not easy, as we know, and the data is often unreliable. And that perhaps is the single biggest takeaway that people can take in terms of doing the Athena Swan submissions. Um, how many heads of departments and EDI leads had uh, conversations, prolonged conversations with HR departments about the quality of the data that is available, both, both in terms of staff, but also in terms of students, in terms of circumstances. And how do we actually feed that through, not just in terms of targets, but also the way that uh, journals think about strategically. So in my position at, as editor, I'm actually in a, um, in a really privileged uh, position because the annual review um, allows us to commission pieces every year to reflect on what happened in the year before. And in that regard, it is for us as editors to really think about what do we want the review itself to look like? What do we think are the key issues? And are there different spaces uh, that we want to go to and different scholars that we want to ask and bring into the fold into uh, one of the leading EU studies journals. Um, that is something that we really need to think about it as a community um, going forward because the impact of COVID is likely to be felt worse on early career researchers, which is where we're finding most of our uh, VME colleagues, but also most of uh, most women are within that uh, particular group. And the question going for us as a community is how do we actually bring in our newly found awareness of equality and diversity inclusion into how we really think about the discipline and how we set the record for what is COVID and the academy post COVID. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roberta. Last but not least, I'm coming to Laura. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm part of an um, editorial team that has um, taken on um, EGIS this year. Um, and this is something, gender was something that was very um, at the forefront of our mind as we were taking on the, the team. Um, so we have um, a kind of a, a balanced editorial theme and we were um, very consciously put a um, women um, team as our lead article in our, our first edition to try and you know um, send out a message about that. Um, so uh, we've looked at um, submissions for the first half of this year versus um, the first half of uh, last year and the year before. Um, so submissions have increased um, somewhat this year, um, about 16%. Uh, and the number, the percentage of submissions um, by women has also increased this year, but that is uh, an increase against a very low baseline from last year where it was um, very low. So um, we are generally around 30% um, as well of, um, of um, female authors um, and last year it had dipped to 16%. So the kind of increase this year is just an increase back to where it was before. Um, I think what's interesting is to think about um, would that have increased further or you know how is how is COVID impacted on this um so you know would we have been um had further female um submissions um if this weren't um happening um and the other thing that we are concerned about i think is as martin said is the longer term impact of this we don't know what that's going to be um, but we think that it's going to be uh, longer term and greater over the longer term because of, um, you know, potential authors postponing new projects and the sort of projects, as you're saying, that um, that isn't and isn't getting funded and that sort of projects that um, people have time to work on. Um, so, you know, what can we do about this? Um, we have been thinking about this. We put out a call on, on um, Twitter for some suggestions. Um, a repeated response was on um, quick turnaround of reviews, um, which of course is a perennial problem. Um, and this is something that you know we're trying to, uh, as an editorial team, really work on. But of course, the issue is that reviewers are also dealing with um, you know, um, care issues and responsibilities and challenges themselves. So, you know, we also don't want to put um, increased pressure on reviewers or expect them to be turning around reviews in addition to their, you know, their work. 
um, at this point as well. Um, so we're considering other steps. Um, so we were thinking about, um, for example, um, increased feedback on rejections, um, even um, so feedback on desk rejections and increased feedback on, on, on all, all our article rejections. And we were talking about doing um, either formalized or informal discussions um, with um, pre-submission so that um, you can approach us and we can give you some feedback, we can um, speak with you, either you can speak with an individual editor or you can get some general feedback. Um, and I think that might help, you know, I hope that might help with the problem that um, Martin was talking about of trying to encourage people to submit to us so you can kind of approach us and say what do you think and we can say yes absolutely or maybe think about this and then and then submit it um, so one you know one thing that we are trying to think about is um, exactly what Martin said how to how to encourage people to submit to us and how to be more more proactive about about this um, so you know what we can do to make our journal a welcome space for women scholars for early career and precarious scholars as well who are you know really impacted by this and, and other groups who are disproportionately affected um, by the current events um, so really what I'd, I'd love to do is you know I've heard some good ideas from 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 people here I'm already taking notes of but I'd really also like to hear from um, people attending of what we can do um, either an, on an individual basis or in terms of long-term policies um, to be able to support you to submit to the journal. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. That's a nice way to end. I'm going to, in the interest of time, open it straight up to questions. Um, so can I ask James Strong, uh, if you're still here, to turn your mic on and ask your question, please? Hello there. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, my name's James Strong. I'm, I'm also a journal editor. I was part of the team that took over from Kyle and Martin at Politics. Um, I suppose my question is, is this. How do we, on the one hand, encourage colleagues who maybe have relevant expertise to come forward and offer that expertise, given the, the circumstances around us, without... Um, reinforcing some of the equality the inequalities that the panel has so has so um, excellently brought out thank you um does anyone want to come in can you wave at me because i can see your martin thanks i no i i, I think that's a really good question james i mean so uh so two things happened uh, or, or have happened in the last kind of three months that have stuck in my mind. One is I wanted to put together a, a, a sort of special forum, um, but it, you know, and I thought, uh, you know, because all journal editors, the minute they have an idea, they think this is a great idea. Uh, and then of course I started thinking about it more and more. And I started thinking like, these are all of these people that I want to ask to write about the impact on them of the, of the, uh, of the pandemic are precisely people who are impacted by the pandemic. And the last thing they need is to be writing about the impact uh, of, of the pandemic on their writing. Um, now, of course, that means also that I abandoned that project, which might have, in some sense, uh, had, uh, had kind of interesting outcomes. It's maybe something that I go back to, uh, or that we go back to as a journal later on, uh, you know, because uh, I had, uh, you know, people and, 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 and particular kind of ideas in mind. So, so I think that's the first, uh, you know, I, I think you're completely right. And, you know, and actually, it would be completely wrong just to pester authors who are clearly, you know, struggling in a variety of ways to, to submit to us. I think what we've got to do rather is make the submission process one that they can uh, benefit from, right? So that, uh, so that it's not just please give me your articles because you know I need to kind of meet these criteria or whatever. It's actually, do you know what? Uh, we understand the, the, the struggle you're having and uh, what we want to do is to try and make the process as hospitable as we can uh, under the circumstances. Um, I think the second thing is, I mean, uh, it's, it's funny to hear Laura talk about kind of people, you know, immediately saying, well, you could make the review time shorter. I mean, reviews in the past three months have been, I mean, I've got one that's now got, I've asked 16 people to review it, right? I mean, 
and they've all got really good and they've all written pretty much all 16 of them have written me really nice email saying i'm so sorry but you know these are the circumstances i cannot do that review for you um and um i think actually one of the things that you know we haven't thought about is you know this kind of huge kind of if we if we get more submissions that means we mean more reviews and that's people who are you know not getting their research done because they're reviewing articles um one of the things we've thought about a lot is moving down the number of reviews we do you know normally we would make a decision on three reviews um, if it's an uncontentious recommendation i.e two reviewers say for example here are the r and r decisions or something like that then i think we can make a decision on the basis of two reviews during this time i'd be worried about making a decision on the basis of one i don't think that would be particularly kind of um, good but um but certainly we could try and reduce the number of reviews We've also tried to reduce the number that we put into review as well, because that's a, an important uh, an important thing to do. But I agree with you. I mean, it's 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 really difficult to be going to people at a very difficult time and saying, "I know you can't do your own research, but could you read somebody else's?" I think that's. And I've been. I have to say, I've been hugely impressed by the number of people who I know are uh, struggling who have written really really helpful reviews that have moved off this work on. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, Natalie Jester had a question which she wrote in the chat. I don't know if she's still here, um, but it, for time I'll, I'll ask the question. So she says, um, thanks for putting this on. What a panel, I agree. Um, I'd like to ask whether anyone has any thoughts on how the current climate might be impacting early career researchers and researchers with health issues and disabilities, and whether there might be any suggestions for mitigation. And can I ask um, Julia perhaps to come in? Because I know she has some thoughts about early career colleagues. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, so this is more, uh, I guess, in relation to early career colleagues uh, more generally. And it was things I was thinking of when the journal editors were talking about things they uh, were doing to hopefully encourage ECRs to submit. And some of these things uh, might be quite small changes, but I think when, with time pressure, really mounting up for people might be things that kind of tip the balance in favor of uh, submission or not submission. Um, so one of the things is um, seeing my PhD student go through a journal, trying to submit a journal to several places and to make a requirement where you don't need to submit in the house style for the first submission. So, so much labor seems to be taken up with changing from footnotes to endnotes to Harvard, whatever. So I think this is a really simple thing that if people nearly have a paper finished, it might tip them over and seems a relatively easy shift to, to make. Uh, the second thing would be to uh, really encourage um, editorial teams to give really clear guidance, particularly to ECRs um, on the back of what can sometimes be really divergent uh, reviewer comments. So I've had PhD students who have received three very different reviews um, and a very hands-off approach by the editor, uh, which has led them to almost a paralysis and then, then a decision not to resubmit because they're feeling so uncertain about the review process and going through it in the first instance. So I, I think particularly for ECRs, a, a more hands-on approach in relation to teasing out what precisely and explicitly you want authors uh, to respond to is really important. And there does seem to be some divergence across uh, different um, journals. Um, and perhaps recognition um, or allowance where appropriate that uh, a second R&R or even a third R&R &R if, if this promise, I think it was Martin who was talking about, uh, if you see the potential. So to let uh, potential uh, authors know that they might get some pretty grueling <laughs> comments first time round, but if this is a paper with potential, that there is the opportunity that it's not respond to these comments and then you're out if you haven't done it to the standard we require, there might be the option for, again, a, I guess a more pastoral way of walking, particularly ECR colleagues through uh, the, what might be their first or if not their first one of their one of their first review processes. So not necessarily speaking to Natalie's comments about um, 
uh, scholars with disabilities, but perhaps more focused around ECRs generally. Can I ask if any of the other panellists want to come in on Natalie's question? Andrew. Thank you. Great comments by Julia. Um, about, I said, when the, as an editor, scholar one's a bit clunky in that respect. So identifying necessarily, necessarily who is an ECR is, can be problematic, um, particularly if you're I'm sorry, like international affairs, we get such a global grouping coming in. Um, I entirely endorse what you're saying, but there's a practicality of who are the ECRs is, the, is an honest question. Um, it's a bit like some of the representations when you would like to know more details of, as editors, we want to make sure we're fully inclusive of different groups and things like that. But we're quite limited in what information we actually have about those submitting. So there's, there's a tension there. And I, I know different publishers have different views, views on what information can be collected and cannot be collected. So it's, there are some structural limitations in that one. But I think what you're saying, and a number of journals have already done it, I know we have, is the, the finickety bit about author, you know, style, most, a lot of journals have just said, don't worry about style at the moment. You know, COVID-19 is, is, diffi is, is difficult. So they, they put that to, to one side at the moment. And I think a lot of editors, if they think a piece has got potential, might go second, third time through. I know we have done in the past, but it's, um, but you, you're making some really great points. And actually, as an editor, it's a nightmare when you get three reviews, one of which is an accept, one's a reject, and one's somewhere in between. And, and, and then try, I can understand why um, authors are struggling to bring those together, because as an editor, you, you're struggling to bring those together. I think we've got to be honest about this. You know, so sometimes it's, uh, we're not always as clear as we should be. Um, but I, know, I think one of the things we can do is, is, is to be more communicative. And we try to make sure we talk to every person who submits within two weeks. Um, but I know what we've had is a lot of pieces being submitted. Our, our, the submission levels have gone through the roof for us. And to reduce the pressure on reviewers, we're just rejecting a greater proportion. Um, so it's making it harder. And it's, it's a really difficult balance to, to make on this case. Um, I haven't got an answer, but I, you know, we, we're dealing with so many different tensions here. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Can I bring Hannah in to speak to the early careers researchers question in terms of support? Thanks. Thank you. Um, those are such fantastic points about the journals. Um, I don't have anything to add to that specifically, but more broader point about early career experiences, particularly in this kind of current moment. And I think, as I mentioned before, I started my lectureship this year. Um, and so the thing that's really struck me is that absolutely absolutely crazy learning curve involved in any new job but also when this is my first kind of full um, time sort of lecturing post and and the way that puts you back in so many ways because you just just learning the basics which aren't necessarily obvious it's just it just takes up so much time and energy so I think that's one thing definitely is just to be aware of those colleagues who you know might not be coming in this year but you know might be coming into their second year still not fully aware of everything um, and also because we're not physically present with each other we can't have those informal how are you getting on or actually dreadful conversations in the corridor which somehow I don't know how other people feel but putting it into an email can somehow feel like quite a formal reaching out um, in a way that people might not feel as you know as comfortable doing um, as they may in that kind of informal physical way so I think that would that would be my comment and um, just to be aware of, of like that and just reaching out to early career uh, people people that are moving between roles and just making sure that they're, they're happy they know what what they need to know. <laughs> Thanks Hannah, that's great. And I think for those of us who are in head roles, that's really important because we haven't got right now the casual encounters in the corridor. And we need to think creatively as, as Richard was saying earlier, I think about how we make sure people feel we're available to them one-to-one -to, -one to, to have those catch-up chats as and as when appropriate on with this kind of technology. Can I ask if any of the attendees have any more questions? I don't see more hands up or um, comments in the chat, but if I just put that out there, because we've got about eight minutes left. So if you haven't asked a question, you've got a burning question, either raise your hand, put it in the chat. And while you do that, I'm going to come to Richard, who I think has had his hand up. 
Thank you very quickly in, in, in the interim between that question and the next one. I just wanted to say something that is obviously obvious to us all, but the self-evidence, which I think should always be reiterated, the care of ECRs, of early career researchers, at this time where care is in deficit and in short supply and we're trying to work it out. Yeah? Care of them is incredibly important. Um, and uh, you know, I, the one thing I've learned in the last few years, coming into a very uh, you know, ref-oriented uh, country and very research-oriented around outcomes that are uh, calculated and so forth, is that mentoring is so important uh, to the ECRs. And I think at this stage, from, from my own experience and from hearing from others within the school and elsewhere, um, those who are mentored and mentored carefully with care um, feel very much more confident about their research outputs. Thank you, Richard. Very important point. Um, can I come to um, Francis Bell, please? Can you hear me now? Yes, Francis. Right. Well, I hadn't had my microphone on because I wasn't intending to speak, but I just wanted to, and I put something that you can look at in the chat, um, which you might be interested in. But um, the other, th I just wanted to say, first of all, it was really helpful. You're not uh, from my field really, but um, it was really helpful to hear what was said. And so I want to thank you for that. But I also wanted to just share with you something that we launched today for a special issue that was delayed because of COVID-19 and has was uh, put out two weeks ago. And in that two weeks, we've worked on starting a collaborative bibliography to do with the uh, subject of the special issue that is we put out now for people writing abstracts but we also uh, intend to de develop it further when people are writing their full papers and encourage them to share references uh, with the specific intention of that supporting uh, people who are new to submitting to journals so that's all i wanted to say thank you so much francis um for brevity we've had a, a question on a different channel from danielle young he says, with the slowdown in reviews, could editors respond to initial submissions, that's initial submissions, with guidance if you think a piece has potential but has an issue that you are fairly certain will be flagged by reviewers so that they can, send, they can address it before it's sent out to review? If you can identify an author as an ECR, this might be really helpful and limit the necessity of multiple rounds of review, though this would create a greater burden for editors I mean, I think um, I, I'll jump in there and say that a lot of the, the editors I know do that already. They're really good at sending a steer when they desk reject, especially if they have a sense that it's from early career people. Um, but yeah, I think Danielle, that point is a very important one. And I think one that editors here will want to take away and consider and think about doing that. And in a way it actually helps with the kind of review problem and the, the difficulties of securing reviewers, if you can get the paper to a stronger place first, it takes some of the pressure off the, the limited availability of reviewers. Um, then Sarah Najeri has asked, the care of ECRs is emerging is very important. Is, a, is there a way to lobby to change the way manuscripts are submitted so that there is a way to tick that one is an ECR? Uh, would any of the editors like to come in on that? Tony, thanks. Right, yes. I mean, I would love this. I'm very much for creating as many uh, options as possible. But I think going back to Andrew's point, that Scholar One is very clunky, right? So everything that um, Martin said earlier about the fact that we can only extract data on corresponding author, which means that, for example, if a team submits and there's a woman on it, we can't even extract that data. So anything we tell you about what's happened in the last um, three or four months is actually incomplete data anyway. Um, for me personally, this is one thing I will definitely take back to our publisher because they're the ones who pay for the different functions in um, Scholar One. But 
you know, just <laughs> speaking to our current experiences, and I know that this is the same across the journals, the different publishers, it's very difficult if, because it's a different firm that is responsible for designing Scholar One. But I guess if enough of us put it out there, that is something that, you know, we'll be grateful for them to think about, uh, it might become an option in the future. Uh, and just to say, I mean, Scholar One, uh, Manuscript Central is not the only, um, it's not the only software or template out there, uh, but it's actually as clunky as it is, I think is the most flexible, which is saying a lot really. So um, just to say thank you and certainly something we will push for. Uh, and hopefully I think we have different um, publishers represented here. I know that they'll do the same. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. So I've got, um, I've got three panelists with their hands up and nothing further, I think, in the chat or questions. So the people who, who have things to say are, we'll go in this order, Martin, then Jasmine, then Andrew, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, these were all really great suggestions. I mean, in one sense, um, and uh, I think that the most important thing for ECRs is actually to make use of meet the editor uh, opportunities, um, because there's also a lot of mis mystification about the editorial process. Um, I have to say, um, I think that what Julia suggests, I mean, we do all of that anyway, and we do it for all of our authors. Uh, you know, so if we desk reject, you get a paragraph of feedback explaining why we've desk rejected it. Um, if you, if we make a decision, you get an editorial decision in addition to the reviews ex outlining what we think you you absolutely need to address in addition to all of the other stuff that the that the reviewers are. And I think that should be done. Um, I think the problem with ticking a box is that the more you think that through, of course, the question is, are you saying that the threshold is different for whoever ticks whichever box? Um, and I think that there are issues are, uh, around that, that 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 then come to the fore like for example if you tick the ecr box will people for example review you know see ecrs as having an easier ride through the review process and so on and so forth so what i would prefer to see is i would prefer to see mentoring as richard talks about it meet the editors workshops uh, and you know good principles of feedback i wish that scholar one forced editors to do things like include text with desk reject or include some kind of text with a, a decision that they make uh, and then it would just become a uh, standard uh, practice i would say that the one thing to remember around um could editors give everybody wants as much feedback as possible and i think that's brilliant but you also have to remember that in may i had 35 submissions um and i had two kids at home homeschooling whilst my wife was out doing her NHS hero job. Um, sorry, I mean that, uh, you know, slightly sarcastically. Um, and uh, and uh, so uh, giving feedback, it wasn't my finest hour, shall we say, uh, in terms of feedback. Um, uh, and, and sometimes I was, uh, you know, three weeks, four weeks, getting that feedback back to people. So um, I think it's also important to remember that editors have, let's say, finite capacity um, and, and perhaps uh, we want to work on kind of these good practice things, uh, uh, you know, for every author. Jasmine. Yeah, thanks. I just want to um, speak to Natalie's question. It's a really good point. Um, and it, this is perhaps not really about how we can improve journal submissions from ECRs. It's a more of a, a deep underlying question is so far when we're talking about how can we help people to sum, submit more to journals, especially disadvantaged uh, groups, we're not really questioning whether we should all be producing this much work. And we're not really challenging or interrogating the model of productivity that we have at the moment. And, and what I would suggest is that, you know, ECR, I've sat on a hiring committee and ECRs are producing a lot of work. They're actually publishing quite a lot already and they're still not getting hired. The level of competition is immense. And actually perhaps we need to reduce the expectations, um, the assessments that we have in formal and formal for what makes a successful academic at ECR level, perhaps even at any level. Um, because I think it's actually unsustainable. It's um, not representative of a lot of the categories of people that we've been talking about today. And actually it's quite a maximalist approach, i.e. somebody or a particular demographic who can devote majority of their time working hours, but actually even non-working hours to their research. That's kind of where we've pegged our expectations and assessments at. So even this discussion, which is brilliant and important, we're sort of suggesting how can we help ECRs, BAME and women reach that maximalist level 
of academic productivity and submissions to journals. And perhaps we need to actually um, revise that altogether. That's I just leave it there. A fantastic point, Jasmine. Thank you. Um, Andrew. I just kind of thank everyone for being for all the questions and for the participants. It's been a, it's been a great session. Um, and to pick it up from what Jasmine was saying, it's interesting how the level of submissions are going up to the top journals. I, I know we we had 33 submissions in March. We had 64 in May. It's if you think about it in terms of finding editorial teams coping with this, finding reviewers and that number of reviewers, it's just extraordinary what we're, we're getting now in terms of how long we this this can keep on going. And I'm very conscious of the pressure we're putting on reviewers for their free labours and and everyone trying to get under this. I haven't got an answer here, but it's it's interesting how much in a sense we're driving ourselves in, into the into the grave in this respect. And what a lot of people have said so far has been we're just re reacting so far. There are much longer term implications for all this and I'm not sure how far where we go with it, but it's it does strike me as a as Jasmine was saying, it's a model that's probably not sustainable in the long term. Thank you so much, Andrew. We have hit 3.30. I'm also conscious that it is one of the hottest days of the year um, and we probably all need a large glass of water. Um, I would like to extend my thanks very much to our audience who have sat here in the heat offering fantastic questions and comments. There are a few comments in the chat that I didn't quite get to, but um, uh, they're worth looking at if people have time before they go. Can I please thank the support teams from Visa and from Chatham House for making the logistics of all of this possible. Can I thank Andrew, my partner in crime on all things journal and gender gap. And most of all, can I thank our fantastic panelists I'm left with a sense that if it's these minds in charge of us coming out of the other side of this, then our discipline and our profession is actually in really good hands with people who genuinely care about our profession and our colleagues in the ways that they should. So my enormous gratitude to all of you. Go and cool down, have a lie down, and I look forward to seeing all of you again in some way or other in the near future. Thank you. <laughs>